The hearing will come to order. The Oversight Committee exists to secure two fundamental principles. First, Americans have a right to know the money Washington takes from them is well spent. And second, Americans deserve an efficient, effective government that works for them. Our duty on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee is to protect these rights. Our solemn responsibility is to hold government accountable to taxpayers, because taxpayers have a right to know what they get from their government. We will work tirelessly in partnership with citizen watchdogs to deliver the facts to the American people and bring genuine reform to the Federal bureaucracy. Today's hearing I will yield myself. Go ahead and start the clock. Today's hearing will examine the Hatch Act's enforcement difficulties and regulatory cost. The Hatch Act is inherently a partisan question, but this committee has looked at it under both Republicans and Democrats. We have seen or failed to see discrepancies in the past. Today's hearing is not on a failure by either agents or either, either party during their time running the executive branch, but rather to review the status of and condition of the Hatch Act and to determine whether there are meaningful changes that should be made to both protect the public and to protect political appointees from inadvertently violating the Act. Inconsistencies within the Act and or loopholes need to be reviewed. This committee takes seriously the use of political office for political purposes. We are not paid to run for reelection or to support a President's run for reelection. But rather, if you are taking the Federal payroll, you are expected to do the job for which you have been selected or appointed. The Oversight Committee is intending to author such legislation as may be necessary and will affect the next President. Necessarily, we will, in fact, work on a bipartisan basis to find any and all changes necessary to take effect upon the inauguration of the next President. Although this, although this is 18 months and it seems like a long time, in political time it is very short. So this will be the first of as many hearings as are necessary to determine those changes, evaluate them, hold public comment on those potential changes, and implement those changes effective January of 2013. And with that, I recognize the Ranking Member for his opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I want to thank you for calling this hearing. The Hatch Act was passed to ensure that uh, Federal Government employees work on behalf of the American people rather than the political party that happens to be in power. The Hatch Act prohibits Federal employees from engaging in political activity on Federal property and from using their official authority to influence elections. The Hatch Act strikes a balance between protecting the free speech rights of hardworking public servants and ensuring that government operations are being conducted appropriately. This committee has conducted significant oversight work on the Hatch Act in the past. After determining that the White House officials provided political briefings to agency political appointees prior to the 2006 midterm elections, the committee conducted an investigation into the activities of the White House Office of Political Affairs. In 2008, former Chairman Henry Waxman issued a staff report of, of that investigation concluding that the Office of Political Affairs enlisted agency heads across government in a coordinated effort to elect Republican candidates to Congress. This report recommended eliminating the Office of Political Affairs. The Office of Special Counsel, an independent agency charged with providing guidance and enforcement of the Hatch Act, conducted a parallel investigation and issued a report of its findings on January 21, 2011. The report concluded that numerous White House officials and political appointees in the previous administration had violated the Hatch Act. On January 20, 2011, it was reported 
that the President would close the Office of Political Affairs. I believe this is an improvement that should have been made back in 2008. Another significant improvement is the appointment of a new special counsel, Carolyn Lerner, who was sworn in just last week. The Hatch Act is meaningless without responsible enforcement. Unfortunate, unfortunately, the Office of Special Counsel experienced significant problems under its previous leader, who was sentenced to one month in prison for contempt of Congress for lying in statements made to this very committee. Now is the chance for the Office of Special Counsel to turn the page, and I look forward to working with the new Special Counsel on the implementation of the Hatch Act, as well as efforts to strengthen whistleblower protections for Federal workers. I also look forward to working with the Chairman and the new Special Counsel on, a, on bipartisan legislation to update and clarify the Hatch Act. The witnesses before us today will express concern that the report issued by the Office of Special Counsel in January was unfair because it established a new interpretation of the Hatch Act that employees were unaware of prior to the report. Many other Federal employees feel the same way. They find themselves penalized after the fact for actions they did not realize were against the rules. Increased training is always helpful to help prevent these problems. But it, is also, it, it, but it also may be helpful to revisit some of these issues legislatively. For example, the Hatch Act does not provide for a graduated penalty system, and Federal employees have been subjected to varying interpretations of the appropriate use of email. I want to thank all the witnesses for coming here today. I look forward to your testimony. I hope that by working together in a bipartisan manner, we will be able to achieve the right balance for the American people and for our Federal employees. And with that, Mr. Chairman, uh, I yield back. I thank the member. All members will have seven days to submit opening statements and uh, additional materials. We now recognize our panel of witnesses. Professor Richard Painter is a professor, uh, professor of corporate law at the University of Minnesota Law School and a former associate counsel to President George W. Bush from 2005 to 2007. Mr. Scott Kafina is a partner at the law firm of Montgomery and McCracken uh, and a former associate counsel also to President uh, George W. Bush from 2007 to 2009. Ms. Anna Maroney is the chief, is a current chief of the U.S. Office of Special Counsel for the Hatch Act. Pursuant to the committee rules, I would ask all to rise, raise the right hand, and take the oath. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record indicate that all witnesses answered in the affirmative. Please be seated. I believe all of you have seen this before, but just uh, for clarification, your entire written statement we placed in the record. We strongly encourage you to use your five minutes for things not just in the record. Uh, but it is up to you. When the light turns yellow, please try to summarize. When it turns red, please yield to the next person. Professor Painter. I am afraid you are going to have to either pull it closer or hit the microphone button. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, uh, thank you very much for inviting me to testify today. For two and a half years, from 2005 to 2007, I was the Chief White House Ethics Lawyer. The White House Counsel's Office had another lawyer cover Hatch Act issues, but I was consulted on Hatch Act matters, and I included Hatch Act compliance in my monthly lectures for incoming White House staff. The Office of Political Affairs, I believe, does not belong in the White House. Uh, and I believe that partisan political activity by White House staff and other government employees in the executive branch is inconsistent with their official duties. There are several problems I see with it. First, the legal distinctions are very difficult to make. Uh, this report from the Office of Special Counsel, I believe, makes that abundantly clear. Figuring out which events are official events, which events are political events, can be extraordinarily difficult. Figuring out who pays for what can be very difficult. And 
figuring out how to use email, whether an email is an official email or a political email, can be difficult. If you make the wrong decision and send an official email uh, through a political email system, you risk losing the record and violating the Presidential Records Act. There are too many legal problems with having executive branch employees and White House staff wearing two hats at the same time, the political and the official. Second, it is conflict of commitment. 100 percent of United States government employees' time should be devoted to the public interest, to the work of the United States government, not to the work of a political party. Too much time is spent by some executive branch um, um, employees, particularly close to an election, on political work that detracts from official duties. And finally, and my most serious concern is conflict of interest, uh, and I discuss this more in my written testimony. When you have political events, particularly fundraisers, that executive branch employees and high-ranking White House staff and agency employees attend in the evening hours and speak with donors about what they want and what they don't want, and all of that is done in a personal capacity. And then those very same people go to the office the next morning to make official capacity decisions, sometimes allocating billions of dollars uh, in our budget or deciding whether to regulate an industry and how. Uh, those discussions uh, had in a so-called personal capacity can have a direct impact on official policy. I believe the conflict of interest is insurmountable. Um, so, therefore, I, I am strongly of the view, I know the law is not this way, but I am strongly of the view that the law should prohibit partisan political activity by uh, executive branch employees other than the President and the Vice President. Um, whatever the law is, it needs to be a lot clearer than it is today in this area. Um, there are a number of issues addressed in the report by the Office of Special Counsel where I think the law uh, has been very unclear. Who, for example, in the White House, on the White House staff, is a so-called 24-7 employee uh, who can engage in political activity during the day, during the workday, in the a United States government building? The law says that anyone who is paid out of the, uh, um, uh, the budget of the Executive Office of the President, who's um, duties extend beyond normal working hours um, and away from the office uh, is exempt from the Hatch Act restrictions uh, with respect to uh, uh, political activity in a United States government building during the workday. Well, I have worked in the White House, and I have seen almost nobody go home at 5 o'clock. I have seen very few people go home at 6 o'clock or 6.30, 7 o'clock, a lot of people there in the evening very late, working weekends, working from home on official United States government business. Uh, so it would seem to me, uh, and I, I know that the White House under several administrations has operated under the assumption that many White House staff members uh, are so-called 24-7 uh, and uh, therefore qualify for this exemption. I do not agree with exemption. I don't think it ought to be there, but it is there. And uh, that is how it has been interpreted under several administrations. And now the uh, Office of Special Counsel report um, has taken the position, uh, referring to the Leave Act, and I think has made a credible argument, uh, but referring to the Leave Act has said that basically commission officers in the White House only uh, may participate in political activity um, uh, of this sort. So this is a serious concern that the law is not clear in this area. Uh, and therefore, I believe strongly uh, that the law needs to be clearer, uh, that uh, the law, in my view, should simply prohibit the political activity of this sort, um, but we need a, uh, a clear message to executive branch um, employees as to what they can do and what they cannot do. I believe my time has now expired. Uh, and it is, but not as a form of a question, but if you will clarify for our freshmen what constitutes a commissioned officer in the White House so that the new members understand? There are 100 commissioned officers, I believe, in the White House, and those are assistants to the President, uh, of which there are 25, deputy assistants to the President, um, uh, of which there are 25, and um, special assistants to the President, um, and associate White House counsels, of which there are approximately 50. Thank you.
uh, none of whom are uniform commissioned officers, is what I was hoping you'd clarify. Oh, yes, very, yeah, that is true, Mr. Uh, Chairman. They are not uniform. Thank you. Mr. Kofina. Chairman Issa, uh, Ranking Member Cummings. Yeah, you've got the same microphone problem, if you could, please. Okay. Chairman Issa, Ranking Member Cummings, and members of the committee, my name is Scott Kofina. And I appreciate the, your invitation to sit before you today to discuss how effectively the Hatch Act accommodates the intersection of politics and policy in the White House. I have had the privilege of serving in the White House two times, first as a staff assistant in the Office of Political Affairs under President Reagan, where I worked under the restrictions of the Hatch Act, and then as associate counsel to President George W. Bush from 2007 to 2009, where my responsibilities included advising the Office of Political Affairs and the rest of the White House staff on the Hatch Act. While the Hatch Act recognizes the unique Federal employment environment of the White House, where the President has the dual role of head of state and head of his political party, the specific rules of the road for White House employees have never been entirely clear. Advising the White House staff on the contours of the law, therefore, has been more of an art than a science. This committee is doing a service to current and future members of the White House staff by considering how the parameters of the Hatch Act um, might be uh, refined um, and clarified to guide their future conduct. The White House Office of Political Affairs generally has been the organizational hub for the President's political advisors. OPA historically has been responsible for facilitating the President's communications with supporters, national campaign committees, and the campaigns of House and Senate candidates, and to plan and coordinate his political activities. It is important to consider, however, that political affairs does not necessarily mean partisan affairs. OPA also supports the President in a wide range of official matters, serving as an important conduit to and from the President's supporters on policy issues, personnel decisions, and appointments. Sound political advice on how policy proposals will be received by the public and their chances for success is an important part of presidential governance. Having a defined office within the White House to support the President in his political role, as well as in his official role, allows for greater discipline and accountability to Congress and to OSC in carrying out their respective oversight and enforcement responsibilities. Therein lies the concern with the White House's decision in January to disband the Office of Political Affairs, a lack of transparency into the political activities of the White House. OPA may have outsourced to the President's reelection campaign office uh, in Chicago, but politics in the White House does not just go away. This committee has rightfully been concerned about how political activities within the White House will be coordinated and executed going forward, which is becoming increasingly more important as the President's reelection campaign heats up. Last week, the New York Times reported that President Obama hosted a group of Wall Street executives, many of them longtime donors, in a meeting in the Blue Room of the White House that was organized by the Democratic National Committee. When asked about this event last week, the White House Press Secretary described it as the President meeting with his supporters in the business arena to solicit ideas about how to improve the economy. It is unclear why the Democratic National Committee would have been used to organize a meeting to solicit advice on the economy. Indeed, this meeting seems to walk a fine line between official and political, with all the attendant Hatch Act concerns. With the Political Affairs Office closed, it is unclear who at the White House would be involved in this outreach to key supporters of the 2008 campaign and in ensuring that they complied with the Hatch Act and the Presidential Records Act. Turning to the um, Office of Special Counsel report, the report released in January uh, about the 2006 election cycle raises a number of important issues concerning the intersection of politics and policy. Unfortunately, OSC did not consider these issues in a constructive way, employing inappropriate legal standards, drawing conclusions based on ambiguous evidence about activities for which the statute provides minimal guidance, and failing to consider important information that would place these activities in a fuller context. One important issue raised by the OSC report is determining the scope of Hatch Act exemption on its workplace restrictions for employees within the White House. The Hatch Act supplies a standard. Those whose duties continue outside of normal business hours and while away from their normal duty post. However, OSC applied a separate employment statute governing pay levels and re leave requirements to determine that less senior members of OPA fell outside of the exemption. The job requirements of associate directors should have qualified them for the exemption, but OSC applied a standard that relies on status, not function. Since the Hatch Act itself provides a standard by which to evaluate, it is improper for OSC to look to the Leave Act instead. The decision to rely on the Leave Act was outcome determinative. 
If OSC had fairly evaluated the job responsibilities of associate directors under the terms of the Hatch Act, OSC could not support its conclusion that they violated the statute by engaging in political activity while on duty. More importantly, if associate directors of political affairs cannot participate in political activities while on duty, they also cannot support the political activities of the President himself. In other words, under OSC's reasoning, the President cannot rely upon junior members of his staff for logistical support for his own political activities. This begs the question about what duties the associate directors have performed in the current White House. The, associate, the OSC report also raises one more complex Hatch Act issue, that being the classification of certain presidential or cabinet level travel as official, political, or mixed, which is important to ensure the proper allocation of costs. In its report, OSC concludes that certain surrogate events were misclassified as official trips and should not have been funded at taxpayer expense because of evidence that such events were politically inspired without evaluating the content of the events themselves, which I submit is a far more objective and easier standard to employ. In, the in, OSC, conclu in conclusion? Yes. In conclusion, um, and I have a number of recommendations uh, that might clarify the rules of the road, um, but I think that the uh, OSC has provided an impossibly subjective standard in terms of trying to evaluate and discern the motivation behind a, uh, political activity and official events, and in a, whereas uh, there are objective criteria that we might employ. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Rohde, I think he was talking about you. He was. <laughs> You're recognized to say in any way you want to respond. Um, Mr. Chairman Issa, Representative Cummings, and members of the committee, I thank you for the opportunity to appear before this committee to discuss the Hatch Act. My name is Anna Galindo Marone, and I'm a career civil servant. I've been the chief of the Hatch Act unit at OSC since 2000. I am pleased to speak about OSC's experience enforcing the Hatch Act. The visibility this hearing brings to the Hatch Act can enhance awareness and understanding and deter violations of the law, which is central to our mission. The Hatch Act restricts the political activity of federal executive branch employees, District of Columbia employees, and state and local employees who work on federally funded programs. The law was enacted in 1939 to address the spoil system that dominated the federal workplace in the 19th and early 20th centuries, under which federal employment and advancement depended largely upon political party service and changing administrations, rather than meritorious performance. In passing the law, Congress determined that placing limits on employees' partisan political activity was necessary for public institutions to function fairly and effectively. The Hatch Act is essential to ensuring that our government operates under a merit-based system and serves all citizens regardless of partisan interests. Indeed, the Supreme Court recognized the purposes enacting the Hatch Act were to ensure the impartial execution of the laws, that the rapidly expanding government workforce should not be employed to build a powerful, invincible, and perhaps corrupt political machine and that employment and advancement in the government service not depend on political performance, and at the same time to make sure that government employees would be free from pressure and from express or tacit invitation to vote in a certain way or perform political chores in order to curry favor with their superiors rather than to act on their own beliefs. The reasons for the passage of the Hatch Act remain as compelling today as they were when it was first enacted, Critical to good and fair governance and to maintaining the public trust is a commitment by public servants to a neutral, nonpartisan federal workplace. OSC is committed to its statutory mission to enforce the Hatch Act, and that commitment is demonstrated in the hard work of the career lawyers that work in OSC's Hatch Act unit. Growing public awareness of OSC's enforcement efforts and increased media attention contributed to rec record numbers of Hatch Act complaints received and advisory opinions issued in fiscal year 2010. During that year, Hatch Act unit staff, which consists of only 15 employees, issued well over 4,000 advisory opinions. Also during that time, the unit received 526 complaints and investigated and resolved 535 cases. Many of these cases were resolved informally without litigation by advising employees they were in violation of the Act and securing their willingness to comply with the law. A number of the complaints the unit investigated or is currently investigated 
in investigating concern allegations of federal employees using their official authority to affect the results of election, including instances where supervisors targeted subordinates for political contributions. Similarly, in state and local cases, the unit investigated allegations of supervisors, including law enforcement officials, using their official authority to coerce subordinates into making political contributions. The unit has been proactive through its advisory and outreach efforts in educating employees about the act. In particular, the unit is responsible for a nationwide program that provides federal, District of Columbia, and state and local employees, as well as the public at large, with legal advice. The unit is also active in OSC's outreach program. In the last fiscal year, the unit conducted approximately 30 outreach presentations. Many of these programs involved high-level agency officials. Notably, several of these programs were conducted as roundtable discussions with political appointees in attendance. As part of OSC's outreach efforts, Hatch Act publications are available upon request on OSC's website and distributed during outreach programs. Currently, some of our efforts are focused on educating federal employees about the Hatch Act and the use of technologies, including email, blogs, social media, such as Twitter and Facebook. OSC also enforces compliance with the Hatch Act by investigating complaints and, in some cases, seeking disciplinary action. In the last 12 months, OSC has sought disciplinary action in several cases involving federal employees who engaged in prohibited political activity, including, a, including in using a government computer to make political contributions or emailing invitations to political fundraisers while at du on duty, soliciting political contributions from subordinates via email, and hosting political fundraiser. The MSPB, the Merit Systems Protection Board, has found that engaging in such prohibited activity warrants disciplinary action. The Hatch Act was last amended in 1993. OSC looks forward to working with Congress if it determines that the act should be amended again. Thank you, and I look forward to taking your questions. Thank you. I will recognize myself for the first round. Could you put the slide up? I think uh, Ms. Glinda Marone, this is from the website of the Office of the President. Can you say whether or not the announcement made in January that uh, the political office was being closed, that it has been closed, or does this mean that it is still open but still in the process of closing? I am sorry, this announcement appears, Chairman, this, this announcement appears where? I am sorry. This is on the White House web website. Oh, on the White House website, I'm sorry. So, I mean, the question is, if it's still on the website as of today, six months after an announcement of its closing, since you work directly on this, is there still an office? Are there still any personnel? Or is this just an oversight that it still essentially appears to be in place? I, I'm not aware of um, the okay. White House's Office of Political Affairs. Um, so this is just legacy, as far as you know? We asked somebody from the White House to come, and we got a refusal for anyone to come from the White House. So this is one of our questions is, Mr. Kofina, you, you said you can't actually operate without this, without having somebody doing the same job. To your knowledge, is there an office there, or is, are other people just doing that job? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I don't know if they have officially closed the office. I, I'm, I do suspect from my own experience that somebody is advising the President and, uh, on political events political activities and also handling some logistics for them, but I don't know the structure right now. Okay, I am going to ask a, a broad question, and, and I will start off by characterizing it. On this side of the dais, we have a much different set of rules, and although it attempts to mirror the Hatch Act, it is a great question for all of you, uh, well, particularly for our two former consuls. One of the things that we have to look at here is anything we ask the administration to do, we have to try to mirror something similar here on the Hill. If we don't, then it would be inappropriate relative to our oversight of their branch versus uh, fairness here. Is it fair to say that in the past, people working in the White House consistently reached out and asked donors for money during previous administrations and probably still today in their exempt role? I didn't say political activities. I said asked for money, solicited people to give money to the campaign to elect or reelect the president. Or re re -elect the president. Please, Mr. Painter, Professor. 
I would very much hope not, because solicitation of contributions is prohibited under the Hatch Act, both in a personal capacity and in a political capacity. They may speak at the fundraiser, but they may not ask for money. But if a Cabinet officer, some are prohibited, but some are not, or any number of other people in the office of the President or in the administration, if they regularly are noted as the person that is going to speak, talk, converse, mingle with people at a fundraiser, are you saying that they are simply being used to gain that, uh, that funding, but they don't make the, the ask, even though they are there overtly, to thank everyone for being there? Yes. I believe the, art, the distinction is artificial. Uh, is a distinction made under the law as it now stands. I do not think they ought to be there. I do not think they ought to be speaking at those fundraising events for exactly the reason you described. So, and, and, I, and I take from Mr. Kofina's uh, statement a line that is hard to defer, discern, which is it is hard to figure out what is a political related to the policy of the President, the ongoing legislation, such as the example of meeting with people who happen to be donors but also happen to be knowledgeable people in the business arena. But is it so hard to have a clear cutoff that people who are on the Federal payroll for the executive branch may not attend fundraisers on behalf of the President's reelection or similar activities for the, hit the party of the President? I believe that works. The President and the Vice President of the United States may attend, and so may you. You are an elected member of Congress. Trust me, if I don't come, I am not getting reelected. Absolutely. <laughs> but uh, leaving aside the elected officials, yes. would you say that in changing the Hatch Act, one thing we should consider is a bright line that prohibits employees of the President effectively from attending fundraisers? Absolutely, yes. I would agree with that. How should we define the difference between a postal worker who attends, who simply happens to work indirectly for the executive branch, and where the bright line should be under the Hatch Act? Uh, that is a more difficult determination, but the political appointees often are either, uh, some of them are Schedule C. Uh, political appointees are easier to designate than the, uh, you can dis designate the uh, difference between a political appointee and a, a career a civil service. Uh, we do that throughout the United States government. Uh, so that would be part of the drafting process for a statute uh, to designate those um, uh, Federal employees who may not attend political fundraisers, but it essentially right. would be the political. Support. My time has expired, but Ms. Marone, would you tell me how that would be if we made that sort of a change to the Hatch Act, a bright line at some level of either level of service or a political appointee? Would that make your enforcement clearer relative to that political activity most commonly called fundraising? Currently, um, the rules, the law does permit all individuals covered by the Hatch Act to attend fundraisers. And in, and in fact, if the individual does not solicit, but they are there as a guest speaker in attendance, as long as they don't personally solicit for the contributions, it is not prohibited. Um, in terms of drawing a distinction between the civil service and the political appointees, the regs, um, um, the Hatch Act regulations that are written by OPM uh, indicate that political appointees may be further restricted. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, okay, I think I will go to the ranking member, if you don't mind. The ranking member is recognized for his questions. Thank you very much. I want to go back to a um, question that the chairman asked about the closure of the uh, political office, my understanding that White House counsel brief staff, both Republican and uh, Democratic staff, on June the 10th, uh, and this was, issue was specifically addressed, and the White House said that the office was closed and that the website was a legacy issue that needs to be fixed, and they need to do that. Uh, I would agree that you, it should not have a, something on a website that is uh, not accurate or what have you. OSC generally provides guidance on the Hatch Act issues through advisory opinions. In 2002, OSC issued an advisory opinion that permitted executive branch employees some limited use of emails to engage in partisan political activities when it was similar to a social conversation around a water cooler. Ms. Marone, is it Maroney? Marone. Marone. Is that an accurate explanation of the 2002 guidance? 
Um, there was a lot of confusion uh, surrounding the, the 2002 guidance. Um, the 2002 guidance was an attempt to address what we saw in the 2000 election going forward, where federal employees began to use their emails, their emails at work, to engage in political activity. In an attempt to address the issue, we um, put out this advisory opinion that in explaining that email could not be used to engage in political activity, what was not prohibited still were water cooler type conversations. But it became known as the water cooler exception, and there's, there's never been such an exception. When we look at what's prohibited, we look at the definition of political activity and its activity directed at the success or failure of a candidate for partisan office, political party, or partisan group. So if the conversation, whether it be via email or in person, does not fall within that definition, then it's permissible. But if it's activity directed at the success or failure of a candidate or one of the other groups, then it would be prohibited. So you're telling us that in March of 2007, OSC basically rescinded the 2002 advisory opinion. Is that an accurate statement? Um, we, we rescinded it because we felt that the federal community um, found it confusing. Mm -hmm. Now, that's not an insignificant difference, is it? In other words, this is uh, saying that something is permissible for five years and then saying that the same actions were no longer permissible. Can you ex explain why OSC's guidance on this issue changed? Because I, I don't see that as being insignificant at all. Sure. Um, the, the position of the office is that the opinion, the guidance has never changed. The way it was being interpreted was the issue. Um, water cooler type conversations have, have always been permissible in that if they, the conversation, the communication is not directed at the success or failure of a candidate, then it's permissible. And that has been the consistent position of the office. But um, readers, some of the readers of the advisory opinion found it confusing. That's why we rescinded it, not because we were changing our position on the issue. Now, do you still get uh, inquiries about that issue? this water cooler email issue? We, we receive a number of inquiries about um, political activity on duty, including um, the use of the email system. Mm -hmm. The reason why I ask that is we are hearing a lot of workers and employee groups um, sort of complain about the two conflicting opinions <laughs> and continued confusion over what an employee can and cannot say, particularly in a casual email. Um, do you think that you have provided the, um, do, you, do you think it deserves even more clarification? And do you see a, a very thin line? Um, we so this is a case-by-case case thing, isn't it? It is. It is. And, and, and the devil is in the details. Um, we, as, as I think I indicated in the opening statement, we issued over 4,000 advisory opinions last year. So there is certainly a need for us to do outreach and continue to provide guidance. Um, sometimes um, these, these issues, there are shades of gray. Mm -hmm. So we have to look at the actual activity, the communication, in order to be able to assist and guide the employee in trying to figure out whether um, it is prohibited or not. Let me ask you this. What are some of the challenges that email and social media pose for OSC and the agencies in terms of interpreting and enforcing the Hatch Act, with technology being what it is today and changing? Uh, you have one kind of technology this morning and then it is outdated this afternoon. Certainly. Um, well, we re and I have copies with me if anyone is interested, but um, we recently issued um, a pretty comprehensive advisory on social media. Um, as issues started to come up within the last 12 months concerning the, the rapid use of it. And some of the issues, for example, include what employees can or can't do um, with respect to posting on their Facebook page or in terms of posting tweets, um, including also issues about soliciting on, on their Facebook page, or what if um, a friend post something onto their page that is a solicitation? Do, are they responsible for removing um, that post or not? In addition, 
Um, we've received a number of issues in this area concerning the, the profile that many individuals have on their Facebook page and the fields, and employees are confused as to whether they can populate the fields with uh, their employment position. I see because my time is up. Thank you. Thank the gentleman. We now recognize the gentleman from South Carolina in his fresh seersucker suit, Mr. Gowdy. <laughs> the only suit that was clean, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Professor Painter, I wrote as quickly as I could while you were talking, and, and I ran out towards the end. You said 100 percent of government employee time should be spent on doing? The business of the United States government. Does your opinion extend to what is called official time? Uh, it extends to official time and to personal time. I do not believe that it, the political appointees in the government should be in their personal capacity. When I say official time, I am talking about union-related activities on government time. I have not considered union-related activities in my analysis here. Well, I would have to think about that, because that, that is a serious concern, uh, the union-related political activities. How, how long do you think it would take you to think about it? Because the analysis, I mean, you were pretty clear 100 percent of the time should be spent doing 100 percent of the people's work. Yes. Does that include lobbying Congress? And union-related activities on on the official on the official clock. Yes. Oh, during their official time sure. when they're actually supposed to be at work. Well, that's what official time means. Is that you don't have to do your day job. You can spend all your time on on union-related activities. I, I, I haven't looked carefully at that area. I don't like it. I mean, my my the my initial reaction is that shouldn't be going on. Would you be gracious enough to take a look at it and, and let me know what your perspective is? Because you have obviously studied this issue more than I have. Yes. The union-related work I have not looked at in detail, but I, I, am, I am concerned about that. Uh, if Good. on the official time uh, there is lobbying going on uh, that is uh, focused on uh, the political I mean, the political activity that I am talking about here is uh, campaigns. There is a separate set of issues that surrounds lobbying Congress and there is a separate set of rules that governs lobbying Congress right. as opposed to political activity geared toward elections. So that is two sets of categories, and these union, I, unions I are doing that. both. I, I get that. If you, if, if you would just look and, and maybe just, just, I don't know, write a paper on it or publish an article or something yes. that, uh, put it where I can read it, though, so maybe in a newspaper, because I, I may not have access to your trade journals or something like that. I would be curious what your analysis Ms. Moroni, let me ask you a couple of questions. In South Carolina, sheriffs run in partisan elections. In other states, they do not, which creates the anomaly that in South Carolina, say, a current United States Marshal, as I understand it, cannot run for sheriff, but in another state, they could? Um, under the Hatch Act, state and local employees that are covered by the Hatch Act, and it is not all state and local employees, but assuming they are covered because they have duties in connection with federally funded programs, um, there is an exemption for elected officials to run for partisan elective office. No, no, no. I mean a current United States Marshal, a current, a current United so a, Federal, a current DEA agent, a current bureau agent. Can they run for sheriff in South Carolina because it's partisan? And do you see any anomaly in the fact that they can run in states where it's nonpartisan? Um, currently, under the Hatch Act, if the election is partisan, they would be prohibited from running. Um, so, in such an election. So in South Carolina, a Federal prosecutor can run for State Court judgeship because that is nonpartisan. But if they want to step across the North Carolina line, they cannot run for judgeship in North Carolina because it is partisan. Yes, if they are covered by the Hatch Act. What is the explanation for that? Because I am struggling with it. Um, I, I, I guess you'd, I would say Congress, I think, would be in the best position to, um, so you would that agree that it doesn't make any sense? I, I don't have an opinion on that. Sure you do. Everybody has got an opinion we're, on it. We are responsible for enforcing the law, and, and currently the law does make those distinctions. Where can, it, can a Federal prosecutor attend a political fundraiser? Yes. Can a Federal prosecutor be on the host committee? No. Can a Federal prosecutor speak at that fundraiser? 
uh, are we talking about a U.S. attorney or an assistant United States an, an attorney? An assistant United States attorney. Um, they would be able to speak at the fundraiser as long as they are not soliciting for political contributions. They can contribute. They can contribute. They can't solicit. Can they ask for help? If they are introducing their United States Senator, can they say, we would like you to help Senator Issa or Senator Cummings? They, they, they could solicit for votes. But not for but money. Not for, num not, but not for money. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but they can, be, they can be contributors, so they can be on the host list because they gave a certain amount and they are put on that list, or do they fall prey to someone who printed something? That, that has happened from time to time, that they have made a contribution and they appear on the host committee, and now they appear to uh, be soliciting. Thank you for making the case for intervention by Congress. Mm -hmm. The gentlelady right. from the District <laughs> of Columbia. Uh, I appreciate this hearing, Mr. Chairman, as we approach another election. Um, I, I must say the, uh, the line drawing in the White House I find particularly difficult, but there are millions of, what is it, almost three million Federal employees who also come under the Hatch Act. Um, um, they are probably more political than most. They are highly educated people, and they are very law-abiding people. I, I just hope, you know, when we lawyers get a hold of something, we tend to really make it confusing. Um, for example, I am a member of the Congressional Black Caucus. Uh, it has an event every single year. We have had to have two briefings. This is our own ethics that the chairman spoke of. We have had to have two briefings. And the kind of thing that I, I think uh, gets people stumbled, uh, for example, is we learned that you could go to an event uh, if there was finger food, and you could sponsor an event if there was finger food, but if it was a hot dog, that was a meal, and you couldn't eat that. You see what that just trivializes? Well, that is what they said with a straight face. When I think of federal, with, with, uh, federal employees, who held to Hatch Act standards, I am I'm concerned that the law may um, make a mockery of itself because the Hatch Act says that um, there is only one penalty, uh, as I understand it, for violation of the Hatch Act for a Federal employee, and that is, uh, uh, that is um, removal. Um, pretty nuclear. Is that true? Well, the penalty provision for um, Federal employees is different than it is for State and local employees. For State and local employees, the only penalty is removal. For Federal employees, um, the presumptive penalty is removal, but if the, by unanimous vote of the Merit Systems Protection Board, it is fa there is found to be mitigating factors, then the um, penalty can some be something less than removal. Uh, well, why was that chosen uh, instead of some, some the kinds of penalties we find in American law generally? And, uh, wh why not have penalties uh, that put a, an employee on no notice? If you do these kinds of things, you'll get this kind of thing. Now, the whole point of the law is deterrent effect. Uh, does the MSM, does the does the Merit System Protection Board often unanimously mitigate? Uh, the penalty? Um, I, I would say just in my experience from the last year um, of the cases that I mentioned in my opening statement, one was mitigated from removal to a 120-day suspension, but the other cases were removals. How many removals? Um, I would have to get to, to give you an accurate answer. I would have to get back well, to you I, with that. I would ask that you send that that information to the chairman and the ranking member and that they share, share it with us. What is the argument against a graduated penalty? Um, I, I, OSC at this time doesn't have an opinion as to whether that would be a good or a bad thing. Anecdotally, I can share that from time to time agencies seem reluctant to refer Hatch Act complaints to our office for concern that if it is a case where the office um, after investig investigating finds that it warrants 
a prosecution that they might lose a good employee. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, so, so um, since the only penalty is removal, uh, far from a deterrent effect, uh, the, the uh, nature of the penalty is such, I take it, that um, it's so, so disproportionate, as it were, to the crime that perhaps many um, violations do in fact not get uh, referred and therefore the violations perhaps are encouraged to continue. Well, certainly, if, if Congress um, wants to consider making revisions, that's something that OSC would be w willing and eager to assist with. Yeah, Mr. Mr. Chairman, this, this is very old law, and I can understand how when there was no experience with it, now that we have almost 3 million employees, it does seem to me that fair notice is a part of due process. And fair notice says uh, this, is, this is how serious we, we, we take certain aspects of this violation to be. Uh, federal employees, I'm not sure about the White House, but federal employees, it seems to me, would be very alert uh, to try to buy. Would the gentlelady that yield? That was the case. Yes, sir, Mr. Uh, I couldn't agree with you more that uh, I've checked and none of our staff was working here when this, this law was passed. So clearly, whoever misinformed us so clearly on writing the law <laughs> we, is no it was longer 1939, with. 1939, Mr. Chairman. Exactly. Uh, well, I have some old staff on my side. <laughs> But uh, you are absolutely right. That is the reason we are holding this hearing, in hopes that we can find this and other problems working with the Special Counsel so that, so that in fact, we can draft changes that make sense for the entire Federal workforce. Thank you, Mr. Back. Chairman. We now recognize the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Wahlberg, for his line of questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the uh, panel for being here. And I, I, I guess uh, for full disclosure, uh, I, I take a position right now that I am not sure that government is capable of putting together a uh, campaign or political activity act that ever will work, uh, totally. But uh, we have what we have and we have to deal with. So let me, let me I have some questions just uh, in general for, for the whole panel, but uh, specifically just to make sure that, uh, that there is understanding on my part. I um, will ask Ms. Maroon uh, first. Uh, what are the civil and criminal penalties uh, for violating the Hatch Act? Th there are no criminal penalties. The civil penalties for state and local um, is removal from employment. With respect to Federal employees, it is a range from a 30-day suspension, no less than a 30-day suspension, to removal. But again, the presumptive penalty, so the starting point, is removal for Federal employees. No criminal penalties. No criminal penalties. Any good reason why not? That not you've that been I'm able to determine. Of. Okay. Um, for the whole panel, and, and feel free to jump in as you uh, care to answer. But do you have any issues with the fact that political activity uh, is not defined under the actual Hacked Act statute, but is allowed to be defined by regulation? Professor Painter. Well, I th it has to be defined uh, much more clearly, either through statute or through clear regulation. To say that anything that might improve the electoral chances of the President or the President's political party is uh, political activity is excessively broad. Uh, the President and his administration are going to want to do what they need to do to get reelected and get members of their party elected. So that definition doesn't work. Uh, and we need a definition that is clear, uh, that focuses on the actual campaigns of um, the activities of political campaigns, fundraising and other activities. And in my view, uh, we ought to have a rule that then prohibits the political appointees, not the career appointees, but the political appointees from engaging in any of that conduct. Mr. Kofina. Um, I, I generally agree with Professor Painter on that. I think that the uh, definition as it is written in the regs um, of uh, political activity would actually serve fairly well if it was the definition of partisan political activity. Um, but as for political activity generally, because as uh, Professor Painter explained, um, policy and politics intertwine so frequently, um, I think it is very difficult sometimes to draw the line based on that, and you start to get into subjective distinctions that do not provide employees with fair notice of what the law is. Ms. Maroon. Um, the, um, the definition of political activity 
is broad, um, but it is um, meant to only address partisan activity. Um, but again, it's through working through the regs and looking at other definitions that, that you arrive at that understanding. Uh, but certainly, at a minimum, updating the regs with more current examples that really address the reality that we see today in the workplace would be very helpful. Well, regarding the executive political activity more generally, um, what is the distinction between political activity and partisan activity? Ms. Maroon. Is that, um, I'll start that direction and come back this way. Sure. Um, I, I would argue that it's that it's the same um, because the definition of political activity um, ties through to the success or failure of a political party, candidate for partisan political office or partisan political group. So when you when you parse out all the different components, it's always directed at partisan activity. So, for example, if you had an employee that was engaged in activity in the office that was directed at a nonpartisan candidate, the Hatch Act would not prohibit that activity, even though they are both elections. So, in reality, it is all partisan? It is yeah. partisan. Okay. Mr. Kofina? Uh, Congressman uh, Wahlberg, I believe you have touched upon um, you know, the primary concern that you have with the vagueness of the definition. And to sort of use an example, um, you can look at the um, Blue Room meeting that I referred to in my statement um, that took place at the White House where the President hosted donors. Um, one can look at that as political activity if you look at the circumstances and note that the Democratic National Committee um, uh, coordinated that event and issued the invitations for it. But at the same time, the description of the event as it occurred was, uh, it seems to have been on policy matters where the President was soliciting advice about the economy. But that, the reality, again, is it is partisan, well, would you say? I, I think it had partisans in it. I think probably the intent of it was partisan. But that is where you get into this very right. fine line that is difficult to draw. It looks like the content was official, but the, certainly the population of attendees and probably the purpose of it was partisan political. Okay. Uh, President Roosevelt, or one of his uh, assistants uh, in the White House, once said, spend and spend and spend and elect and elect and elect. Uh, I mean, the objective, of course, of any administration is to do that which will uh, lead to the political su success of the President and his political party. I, I just uh, I don't see that a definition that focuses on that objective is a a narrow enough definition of political activity to work when we have a, almost a trillion dollars of stimulus money uh, being spent. Of course, it's spent uh, for with the hope of um, uh, of political success. Uh, may not work, uh, but that's a different issue. Uh, you know, I, I think we need a much narrower, more specific definition of partisan political activity that focuses on the activities of the campaign, and that's what the Hatch Act is directed at, not at everything else that goes on in government that might lead to success. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. The gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Connolly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and welcome to the panel. Um, Mr. Kafina, you, you worked in the Bush White House. I did, Congressman. And you indicated that you were in agreement with Professor Painter about uh, certain aspects of the uh, definition of what constituted political activity and trying to constrain them. Yes. In the Bush White House, is it not true that the Office of the Special Counsel found blatant examples of violation of the Hatch Act being conducted by the Office of Political Affairs, for example, political briefings to GSA and other Federal agencies, highlighting vulnerable members of their parties, members of Congress at the time, uh, throughout the uh, 2006 campaign season, in order to basically highlight the vulnerability and a strategy to help? Were you aware of that? Well, uh, Congressman, I was not in the White House during the time of those briefings, um, so I am a little bit hamstrung to comment on how they were um, executed, because to me the important part of those briefings is not simply that they took place, but how they took place. But the, you, you are aware of the fact that OSC, in fact, did a report on these and cited them as violations of the Hatch Act. Oh, of course I am aware of that, yes. Okay. And, um, and, and presumably, 
the action of the Obama White House to abolish that office in part grew out of the controversy surrounding that activity. Is that not correct? Well, I think there have been um, controversy surrounding, off surrounding the Office of Political Affairs and its existence going back to when it was formed under President Reagan. So I can't speak to why the Obama administration made that decision. Um, uh, I know uh, President Obama, when he was candidate Obama, spoke about abolishing it right away, and um, he ultimately made the decision two years later, but I am not privy to, to why he made the decision or why he did it then. Professor Painter, I thought I saw you shaking your head. Well, I think it ought to be abolished. I think the President did the right thing, um, abolishing it. I wish he had done that two years earlier. Um, I don't think the arrangement works to have right. an Office of Political Affairs. Uh, but he needs to not just abolish the Office of Political Affairs, but shut down partisan political activity in the White House, period. It doesn't help just to shut down the office and, and have people lingering back in the White House who are doing the same type of stuff in a different office. Okay. Um, Thank you. Um, uh, Ms. Galindo Marone, um, one of the strange aspects of, I, I mean, whenever you regulate, you are going to get sadly, sometimes into the weeds. But one of the weeds involves photographs with the President of the United States. And there are actually restrictions on which photographs can be used and when. Is that correct? Um, yes. So, we for example, if the President is up for reelection, although presumably every President in his first term is up for reelection, but all right, the year of the reelection, and Sally Q just happens to be at the USDA in the atrium, and there's the president. And someone takes her picture with the president, and proudly she puts it up in her cubicle because she's with the president. That's actually a violation of the Hatch Act in a reelection year. Um, if the president is already a candidate, um, depending on the picture, it may or may not be a violation. Depending on the picture. That is correct. According to the regs. Um, federal employees may not display um, pictures of candidates in their offices or in federal buildings. So um, a unique situation occurs each time we have a president running for reelection because the incumbent still continues to be the head of the executive. At the same time, the incumbent is now a candidate. So we try to strike a balance by saying that official photographs can continue to be displayed. but. Um, if it's not an official photograph, um, it should not be displayed. And even as to official photographs, just to highlight sometimes the issues, we've had individuals in the past that have uh, painted horns or halos on pictures or um, placed the pictures upside down in order to demonstrate their, their support or opposition for a candidate. So even as to the official photographs, we indicate that they should be displayed in a traditional size and manner. Hmm. Do you think most members of the workforce are aware of that? I'm sorry. Do you think is that a, a regulation or a guidance that that is, is a guidance? We no, no. Is it widely known within the federal workforce? Well, I've, I'd like to think so. Um, every time I go out and I do outreach for the last eight nine years, I've been talking about the guidance. It's published on our website, but it's it's a big federal government workforce, and we're a small um, agency. Well, Mr. Chairman, my time is up, and I thank you. But I, I got to say, I, I think we do need a Hatch Act to set the rules of engagement. But when you actually prohibit somebody from a personal photograph of the President because it's a reelection year, to me that crosses the line. Would the gentleman yield? Yes, absolutely. You know, uh, I have an old friend down in Alabama, and he says, you know, that's as clear as mud. And I think the gentleman did a good job of pointing that out. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentlelady from New York, Ms. Burkle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for calling this hearing today. Um, very important topic. Uh, I just want to follow up with something my colleague, um, Mr. Connolly, brought up, and that is the OSC uh, findings and the report that was done. And I'll address this question to uh, Ms. Galinda Marone. In that, I, we've heard testimony today that really it just wasn't the Bush administration. This is a systemic problem that we see. But the OSC report only focused on George W. Bush's preg uh, presidency. Can you explain why that, the scope was so narrow? Um, we um, investigated the Bush administration because those, those were the allegations that we were investigating. 
However, we took note in the report um, that it seems that this is a problem that has occurred in previous administrations, so that this was not um, a unique circumstance to the Bush administration, but we were investigating the case we had before us. But the concern would be that we singled out George Bush's pre uh, presidency rather than looking at the whole scope of where the problems might be. Also, that report, the time frame was 2009, 2010. It was re released in 2011. It was released in 2011. And so it investigated, looked back at 2006. That seems like a long time for that report. It took, it seems like it took a long time for that report to get done. Why wasn't President Obama, I mean, that was two years of his presidency, why wasn't he included in any of that report? Um, the investigation and the allegations arose in 2007. So the majority of the evidence, as we gathered the evidence, um, centered around the 2006 activities. Um, we typically do not, that, that I'm aware of, we've never combined. I mean, we investigate the case we have before us, and um, we don't look to another administration in terms of first completing the investigation that we have before us. I want to move on to my next question, but just if, if you could, do you know who waged or who uh, made the allegation and made the complaint? Um, well, it, it arose from a complaint that was filed um, concerning activities at the General Services Administration. Um, so we first received a complaint concerning a political briefing that occurred at GSA. Um, and then while we were investigating that one case, uh, we learned of additional um, briefings that had occurred throughout 22 federal agencies. So we opened a separate case. Thank you. Mr. Kofina, I, I don't know if you would like to comment on that quickly, if you could, so I can get to my next question. On uh, what, Congresswoman? On and, and this, the OSC study, it seemed like you wanted to say something or you had a comment to make. Um, well, I, you know, I, I think that um, they did acknowledge, uh, I think, in one sentence that uh, there was some historical fact of um, these events that they um, called out in their report as having occurred in prior administrations. And in fact, you know, the history of political briefings goes back, I believe, as far as President Reagan. The, the Political Affairs Office has had a fair amount of continuity in terms of, through both Democratic and Republican administrations, in terms of the types of things that they've done. Um, and I think that with that type of historical precedent, without any enforcement action by the um, Office of Special Counsel, I think it's you know, especially unfortunate that members of the Bush administration, specifically hardworking, more junior members of the administration, um, were sort of labeled as lawbreakers um, when they, I believe, in complete good faith that what they were doing was within the law, um, simply followed the practices that their predecessors of both parties had done. Thank you. My next question is really for all three of you, and I'm not sure we're going to get to have all hear from all three of you. So we'll start with Professor Painter. Um, what are the restrictions on the meeting, such as was held at the White House and um, organized by the DNC? I do not know all of the facts about that meeting, and I am hearing uh, conflicting views as to whether it is political or official. If it's an official capacity meeting in which official policy is being discussed, um, by White House uh, staff members in, in acting in their official capacity, the DNC should not be organizing the meeting. The White House should be organizing the meeting. If the DNC is setting up the meeting, uh, that is a political meeting. And in a political meeting, uh, the uh, White House staff who participate in that meeting are doing so in a personal capacity with, without use of official title um, in a personal capacity, and they are talking about political campaigns or whatever they want to talk about other than asking people for money. That is the one thing they cannot do is solicit contributions. Um, I would never have agreed to having such a meeting going on in the White House itself, in any room of the White House. I know there is controversy about that, um, but I would not want to see those meetings, quite frankly, going on in Federal property. What the legal restrictions are is somewhat more ambiguous. It seems to me with the DNC sending out the invitations and organizing it, it smacks of partisan, political, what we are talking about here that really shouldn't be allowed. I see I am out of time. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, I apologize that so many members were unable to get into a 
previous uh, or into this hearing because it is not yet the voting time. But I have been asked, uh, would each of you agree to accept, uh, if you will, friendly interrogatories, a series of questions that you may answer in a reasonable period of time so that members who are not here could ask questions uh, after they have looked at the record? Certainly. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So our normal policy is uh, to hold the record open only for five days. In this case, we are going to hold this record open for 30 days so they can ask questions and, and we will extend it even further if you need more time to answer. Let me just ask one closing question. Do you all agree that whatever we do at the Hatch Act, we must have a carve out for the security of Cabinet officers, the, particularly the President and Vice President, in other words, some accommodation within the Hatch Act to recognize that the locations in which the President may have meetings with supporters and the like has to be consistent with some form of security for himself and other key members that may in the future Hatch Act be allowed to participate. That, that's really, it, it's an, I'm hoping it's a softball question, but it's one that I'm deeply concerned that we not create a situation in which we put certain officials in a position where, in order to have the kind of meetings they need to, they find themselves in facilities inappropriate, recognizing that the White House is the most appropriate place usually for the President. Mr. Painter. Uh, yes, uh, I would. My view of that ought to be only the president and the vice president who engage in partisan political activity. But if other officials are allowed to do so, we have to provide security. And who pays for the security is not the point. Okay. Uh, we have had one other member uh, arrive for first round. We recognize the gentlelady from New York, Ms. Maloney, for five minutes. Well, I just want to thank you and uh, the ranking member for holding this hearing. And uh, I. Uh, I am going to put my uh, uh, questions in writing <laughs> in the interest of uh, other, other meetings we have to get to. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and since we previously agreed to answer an interrogatory style set of questions, I want to thank you once again for your patience and your participation. And this hearing is adjourned. Thank you, thank you. Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you.